So the title of my talk is around dementia and delirium, and I'll explain what we mean by those terms during the talk, um, and the impact of stroke and acute illness on thinking and memory. And my post, so I'm one of the acute physicians um, and geriatricians at the John Radcliffe Hospital, um, and half of my time is spent doing clinical work with patients who have acute illness, and half of it is spent doing research, which is around the areas of, of thinking and, and memory, cognitive impairment, and how it's impacted by stroke and other medical problems. So just to give you an outline of the talk, I'm going to, as I said, explain what we mean by the term dementia and then what we mean by the term delirium, probably one you're less familiar with and won't have heard so much about in the media, and then come on to talk a little bit about how stroke and acute illness affect thinking and memory and what these implications are for us at the General Hospital and the way we look after patients, um, and in particular what measures we're trying to bring in and make sure happen uh, within the Oxford University hospitals to make sure that we try and look after confused patients as well as we can. Um, so dementia is a syndrome with many possible causes and one of the things that I get asked quite often, in fact I was asked on the radio recently, was what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Because probably people are used to hearing the term Alzheimer's disease, particularly in the media. Um, and we need to be um, careful about terms here because there is, is quite a lot of confusion. But dementia is really a syndrome, so it's a, a pattern of um, <coughs> clinical symptoms and signs that has many underlying possible causes. So it's ir an irreversible condition, so it can't get better. And the person has problems with thinking and memory that are severe enough to impact on their daily life. In other words, they can't look after themselves without a significant amount of help from other people. And as I was saying, there's many possible causes of dementia, but when we're thinking about older people, so 65 years and above, um, the main causes are Alzheimer's disease, and I'll explain what that is. Um, followed by what we call vascular dementia, which means in relation to the disease of the blood vessels or problems that's arising from the blood vessels that supply the brain, and then other types. And there's a schematic graph there to show the um, rates of those different types of dementia across different European countries. And you can see that Alzheimer's in the light grey is the most common cause of dementia in older people, followed by vascular dementia. And I've put the pictures of um, Thatcher and Reagan up there because they illustrate the two most common types. So some of you might have seen the film recently of the Iron Lady with Meryl Streep in which she portrayed Mrs. Thatcher once she had had her decline in, with vascular dementia and Ronald Reagan had Alzheimer's disease. So when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we're talking about specific pathological changes in the brain. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but essentially there are changes in the nerve cells in the brain. So there are a build-up of something called neurofibrillary tangles inside the nerve cells. And then outside the nerve cells, there's an accumulation of abnormal protein called beta amyloid. And ultimately, there is nerve cell loss within the brain, and this causes brain shrinkage. And you can see in the diagram on the left, there's a normal brain. And on the right, there's a brain um, in cross-section of somebody who died with Alzheimer's disease. And you'll see at first there's a big difference in size of the two brains because the brain with Alzheimer's disease has lost a lot of cells. But also, if you look at the bottom of the brain slices, you'll see an area called the hippocampus, which is labelled on the left. And you can see in the normal brain that's quite nice and thick but on the right-hand brain, it's really shrunk away to nothing. And this is the part of the brain that deals with laying down of new memories, and it's loss of this part of the brain that means that people with Alzheimer's disease, in particular, have a problem with laying down new memories. So people tend to be repetitive, and they don't retain new information. A second type of dementia, which I didn't mention, is slightly less common, but still we see a lot of in older people, but also is a disease primarily of the nerve cells rather than the blood vessels, 
is something called Lewy body disease. And again, when we look down the microscope, we see specific changes in the nerve cells of the brains of people with Lewy body disease. And they have clumps of abnormal protein in them called ubiquitin. And there is some overlap between Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease. So patients who have Lewy body dementia will often look quite similar to somebody with Parkinson's disease, but they will have very prominent thinking and memory problems. And then the, the other common type, as I said, is vascular dementia, so to do with the blood vessels or the blood supply to the brain. And one thing to be aware of is that this is a very um, varied condition. So some people will have clots resulting in a loss of uh, supply of blood to the brain, and <coughs> other people will have hemorrhages. So there will be a bursting of a blood vessel and a bleed into the brain. And there are lots of different pathologies to do with the blood vessels that can cause these types of events. But one thing that I think perhaps isn't appreciated enough by the general public and also probably by politicians is the close link between stroke and dementia. So we know that around a fifth of patients who have a stroke will have a dementia if you examine them within the first year after that event. Um, and that's more likely in people if they are older, if they have lots of strokes, and if they have a more severe stroke. Now, the reason that we as clinicians are interested to try and decide what type of dementia a person has, in other words, what the underlying cause is, is partly because they look different clinically and also because the treatments are somewhat different. So in Alzheimer's disease, I mentioned the characteristic <coughs> symptom of memory loss, and this is particularly noticeable early on in the disease whereas patients with vascular dementia tend to show a slightly different picture. So they may have problems with planning and sequencing. And when, when we talk about that, we mean things like, for instance, making a cup of tea. So you have to work out in your mind what you're going to do when, and you have to do the actions in a certain sequence to be able to make the cup of tea successfully. So for instance, somebody might put the tea bag into the kettle um, or not boil the water and put co cold water onto the tea bag. Um, they're often quite inattentive, so they'll be very distractible, um, not able to focus on one thing um, at a time. Um, and sometimes patients will show apathy, so they show a lack of engagement with other family members, or they might start losing interest in their former hobbies or what they used to like doing. And there's frequently an association with depression. Um, in Lewy body disease, I mentioned already the Parkinson's type symptoms that patients have and they may fluctuate a lot, so they may be fine at one minute and then be quite confused the next. And this is also very typically associated with visual hallucinations. So people may describe seeing uh, people or children, or they may think there are other people in the house with them who aren't in fact there. And although that sounds very frightening, usually people, the, the person themselves is not unduly bothered by this. Now, I've talked about dementia, um, and as you're probably aware, um, in most patients with dementia, there's a gradual change over time. Um, so the person starts off with normal thinking and memory, and over a number of years, there's a gradual change, such that after a, a, quite a considerable time, they've developed dementia. And that's shown by the graph on the left there. So that would be typically what we might see in the memory clinic. However, um, when we're in the acute hospital environment, we actually see a number of other patterns of change in thinking <coughs> and memory. So if you look at the right-hand graph, you'll see um, some schematic representations of how people's thinking and memory might change with time in the acute hospital. So at the top there is a lady that we admitted with um, a fractured hip after a fall. And as far as we could work out from speaking to her family, She'd been entirely normal from a thinking and memory point of view until she'd had this fracture. And then she became very unwell after the operation um, and she became very confused. And although there was some improvement as she got medically over the operation, there wasn't a return to her pre-injury level and she continued to decline subsequently um, quite rapidly from both a thinking and memory and a functional point of view. In other words, she couldn't really walk or get back to her physical state. Um, the second tracing is a, a gentleman who presented to us with a stroke, 
and you'll see that there was a step down in his thinking and memory at the time of the stroke, and then he stayed stable for some months, um, and then he had another stroke event and had another step down, and that resulted in a vascular dementia. But again, it wasn't the gradual decline that we might see in somebody with an Alzheimer-type picture. And at the bottom, um, this is probably the most common scenario we are faced in the general hospital. So this is a patient who's coming with an acute illness, whose uh, thinking and memory is impacted very rapidly by the fact that they are unwell with an infection. It fluctuates a lot on the ward um, and then may improve as they get over the infection until they have a second infection episode and the same thing happens again. And again, we see quite a rapid decline in thinking and memory and then some fluctuation um, before it may return towards the normal level or may not actually completely get back to the pre-admission level. So as I said, that's probably the most common scenario we see in the acute hospital. So that brings me on to talk about delirium. So um, delirium is a term that I suspect a lot of you are not familiar with, apart from perhaps from uh, 19th century novels, um, where you see it is occasionally used to describe people, for instance, who went out and got infectious diseases in the colonies, for instance, malaria, and people will be described as being delirious. And these are often quite young people, but who were very severely ill and became very confused. So this is our medical term for an acute confusional state. Um, so this by, um, as the name would suggest, is a sudden change in thinking and memory. Um, there may be fluctuation over short periods of time. Patients often very inattentive. So for us, when we admit the patient, we'll often see they're quite agitated. They may be pulling at uh, equipment around the bed or pulling at the bed clothing. Um, or the patient may be very drowsy and sleepy, um, and sometimes that's harder for us to detect because it doesn't actually cause a nursing issue in the same way that agitation does. And this is associated with an underlying medical problem. So it's frequently infection, but there may be other things going on as well, um, such as constipation or pain, or there may actually be lots of different things that are contributing to this person's being unwell. And when we look at the risk factors for delirium, you can probably see that a lot of these factors are common to the patients that we admit to the general <coughs> hospital. So patients are severely ill, um, usually otherwise they wouldn't be admitted as an emergency. Um, a lot of them have infections. Um, they may have an underlying dementia already, um, or they may have had previous delirium episodes with infection or other illness. Um, a risk factor is older age um, and other problems such as not being able to see or hear um, properly. And uh, you're probably aware that as people move around the general hospital, they're admitted through the emergency department and get transferred to different wards. <coughs> it's actually all too common that the patient's glasses and hearing aids get mislaid along the way, um, which doesn't help them when they're trying to interpret the new environment. Um, lots of medications, so patients being on lots of drugs, and again, that's very much a feature of our older patients. And also in the acute hospital, unfortunately, we're very good at sleep depriving people. I don't know if any of you have been admitted to hospital, but it's very, very difficult to sleep at night um, on the general ward, let alone in the emergency department. So, um, as I said, a lot of acute illness can, be, um, can result in delirium. And one of the things that I think perhaps, again, isn't as well recognised as it could be is that a lot of our patients with stroke will develop delirium, so they'll become acutely confused. So we tend to think of stroke as causing a focal weakness, so left-sided weakness or loss of speech, problems with vision, um, that's sudden in onset. But some of our patients will have that and will also have a more global problem with thinking and memory, so they will be more confused than usual. <coughs> And very occasionally, we don't see the uh, focal deficit. So the patient doesn't appear to have any weakness or new change in speech, but they present with an acute confusional state with a delirium. And this is a brain scan from a very elderly lady we admitted, um, very confused, on a background of some cognitive decline, but definitely much worse than usual. And um, sorry, I don't have a pointer, but you might be able to see if you look at the left-hand side of each of the brain scans, there's a black area um, on the left part of the brain. And this lady has had a recent stroke. 
and we only <coughs> discovered that when she had a brain scan because we couldn't find out why else she had to be why else she was acutely confused. So there was no evidence of an infection. She wasn't in pain. There was nothing else to explain it. So we did the brain scan, and she was um, shown to have a stroke. What about people with more minor um, stroke-like episodes? So this is a patient who had a mini-stroke, what we call a TIA, and again, some of you will be familiar with that term. And we tend to think of this as a relatively benign uh, condition in itself, although it is a risk factor for future strokes, so we worry about it because people need to be put on appropriate treatment to prevent another uh, worse <coughs> event happening. But it's become apparent more recently that that even these very minor events can impact on patients' thinking and memory. And this might be a, a, a warning sign, if you like, that this person is at risk of developing dementia in the future. And I've just shown this graph from a gentleman who um, came to see one of my colleagues in the geratology clinic um, complaining of his poor memory. And he was actually a very um, highly educated man. Um, he worked at Harwell. He had a postgraduate degree but he was convinced his memory wasn't right. And he saw my colleague and he had a test done and you can see that first diamond on the left there um, at about 20 months before his TIA. He scored 29 out of 30 on the thinking and memory test, which usually we'd regard as pretty good, but he was convinced there was some, something wrong. Um, so he was reassured, um, but then a little while later he had a TIA and he was seen in our emergency clinic, and he was retested with the same test. And you can see that his thinking and memory of this occasion was only 23 out of 30, despite the fact that he was apparently completely recovered from his mini-stroke. He didn't have any weakness or any other problems, um, but his scores had dropped. On retesting a month later, they'd come back up to 30, so again, he was reassured, and you know this was felt to be just a, a one-off event. Um, but if you look over time, when he was followed up to, out to five years after that TIA, in fact, he declined rapidly and developed dementia. So we felt this identified a group or somebody who was um, cognitively fragile, so he was already only just coping in terms of his thinking and memory, and possibly because he was well-educated, it was less obvious on the test than it might have been. And then when he had the TIA, that was enough of a stress for his brain for it to reveal the fact that it was struggling. And um, then he subsequently declined and developed dementia. And we've since gone on to look at this in our research studies, and we've confirmed that this does affect... This phenomenon of having a reduction in your thinking and memory affects about 20 to 30 people, 30% of people with a TIA, and it does denote a population at increased risk of cognitive decline. So it might be a way in future to identify people that we could intervene with to try and reduce the chance of developing dementia. Now, coming back on to why dementia and delirium are important in the hospitalised population, <coughs> and you might be aware that there's been some discussion in the press about care concerns around patients with dementia or confused older people in hospital. And it's clear that these conditions are associated with an increased risk of death during admission, of being admitted to an institution on discharge rather than going home. These people spend longer in hospital, and it costs a significant amount both socially and in financial terms. And also for people who haven't previously been diagnosed with dementia, if you come in and you have an acute confusion or episode of delirium, your risk of dementia is much increased on follow-up. So this is just to show you that um, I'm coming on to talk about why hospitals need to change and how, well we, how we look after a patient population. And this is just to show you how stroke and dementia are, fat, are diseases of older people. So the fact that our population is ageing means that we are going to see more patients with dementia and more patients with stroke. And of course, because stroke is linked to dementia, again, that will um, increase the numbers with cognitive impairment. And this was a very influential report from the Royal College of Physicians uh, in 2012, really making the point of how the ageing population is changing what we see in our hospital um, in terms of our patient case mix. So when I qualified, which was quite a long time ago now, in 1992, 
Um, a lot of the patients I admitted uh, when, who were coming in as unplanned admission were middle-aged or younger old people with a single problem. Now, we know that over two-thirds of people are admitted at over 65, and huge numbers of the people are, are very frail. They may have a diagnosis of dementia, which may be known about before or not, and they often have multiple other medical problems. Um, and they made the point in this report that only half of the patients who have dementia who are in a general hospital with unplanned admission have a known diagnosis. In other words, to those of us who admit people who are older hospital, they don't, a lot of people don't come in with a label, with a pointer from the community that they have a cognitive problem. And this is a, a difficulty for us because it means we have to identify it um, and quantify it. So what are the causes of confusion in hospital patients? So I've talked about dementia, which is the chronic uh, confusion, which is irreversible, and delirium, which is the acute confusional state. And there are a number of factors, this ties in with the risk factors for delirium, that we um, know are active in the acute hospital environment. So people being unwell, the new environment change, um, people are given lots of new medications, they may be in pain, and this is all on a background of, in older patients, having existing nerve cell loss and possibly underlying cerebrovascular disease, as I said, much of which may not previously have been identified. And so um, the government, back in 2009, um, brought out a national dementia strategy because it was becoming increasingly recognised about <coughs> the size of the problem. And I'd just like to focus on the objective number eight of their strategy, um, which was improved care for patients with dementia in hospital. I've used their terminology there, which was dementia sufferers, which we tend not to use. So, so they wanted to try and improve the care of these patients in the general hospital. And they made the point that many of our patients, the majority of patients are elderly, and a lot of them will have cognitive impairment, much of which we are not aware of. So what they didn't tell us to do how was in that report was, was what we were actually supposed to do about it. So how were we supposed to go about improving the care of these patients in the general hospital? So locally, um, we uh, developed a number of objectives that we needed to fulfil, really, to have a chance of imp improving the care. So the first one is to recognise that the patient was confused. So that might sound obvious, but I'll give you some case examples in a minute that shows that it isn't. Um, and then we need our staff to decide whether this confusion is new, so is it a delirium, or is it old, that the patient has come in with it and it's a dementia, or is it both? And that's probably the most common scenario, actually, that you have the delirium superimposed on an existing dementia. And we need to quantify it, so we need to have an idea of how severe it is, because that will determine how we care for that patient. So why do we need to routinely screen for confusion in our hospital patients? You might think, as I said, it would be obvious to staff. Um, but this is a very telling um, account from Dr. Judy Shakespeare, who some of you might actually know, um, a well-known Oxford GP. She's recently uh, retired. Um, and she wrote about her experiences as a, as a relative of a patient, which was her dad, when he got admitted to hospital, which wasn't the John Radcliffe, it was somewhere in the north of England, um, and her experience looking in from the outside. So she described her father as being a very um, uh, able uh, chap in his 90th year. Um, he was able to deliver an articulate after-dinner speech at his own birthday. He was living alone and he was independent. And then he became generally unwell and he had to be admitted as an emergency to the general hospital. No one was quite sure what the problem was, which again is quite common. Um, but because he'd previously been independent, he was assessed as self-caring um, in the hospital. Um, he needed to have an endoscopy, so a telescope test to look down into his tummy. Um, and as in the way of these things, it was cancelled several times and he became dehydrated. When she went up to see her dad, um, she was aware that none of the nursing staff nor the foundation doctor looking after her father were aware that her father had become confused. And because of that, his care plan was not changed. 
And at night he got up to the toilet and because he was confused and unsteady, he fell over and fractured his neck of femur and unfortunately died um, a couple of days later. So that's one story. Um, and this is a patient account from uh, our institution of a lady who was 94 without a previous diagnosis of dementia who was admitted to one of the surgical wards again as an emergency. She appeared very socially adept. She was very pleasant um, and plausible to the staff and said she was independent at home. Um, but it transpired after the procedure that she couldn't remember that she'd had a procedure done. She didn't know where she was. Um, and in fact, this lady was normally resident in a care home. So clearly this lady's management and discharge could have been much better managed if it had been detected um, how confused she was at the beginning of her stay. So that shows why we need to, to do it. Um, what about the, um, what we've been doing in terms of improving this? So um, this shows you some baseline data um, from the National Dementia Audit, which the um, OUH took part in. Um, now this is going back to 2010, so these are baseline data. Um, and you'll see that um, this was a, a review of the notes of 40 of our patients to come in as an emergency and how well we did at documenting various things. So the sort of medical history, um, the medications the patients was on, um, the medical management plan, you'll see all that on the left hand side of the graph. These are all very well done, well documented. But if you look to the right hand side of the graph, these are the things that are dealing with assessment of thinking and memory and the patient's mental health status. And you'll see that we do much less well so patients weren't being screened for delirium. The patients weren't having any assessment of their thinking and memory function um, or their mood, so whether they were sort of feeling low in mood and depressed. So that, that was our baseline data from the National Audit of Dementia. And this is for people with known dementia when they came into the hospital. So you'd have thought if anybody, they would be the ones who would have been having those um, examinations. Um, and then this is also baseline data from 2011 from um, a consecutive sample of patients with unplanned admission to the JR. This is older people <coughs> aged um, 75 years and above. How many of them had any sort of um, quantitative assessment of thinking and memory? And you can see that the rates were very low because there wasn't a systematic process in place then to do that. So what have we done to try and improve that? Um, well, we now have developed what we call a clerking pro forma. So our junior doctors who are admitting patients to hospital have to take down a certain amount of uh, mandatory information. And this is how the clerking pro forma starts. So all our patients who are aged 75 years and older will have um, what's called the AMTS. And you can see those questions on the left side in the box. So they'll be asked 10 questions um, around, uh, for instance, their age, um, the year, where they are, and there'll be a simple recall memory test. So they're given an address to remember and asked if they can remember it. And then they get a score out of 10. And then we also ask the staff to do uh, to think about whether the patient has got um, any evidence of a delirium and we ask them to use the confusion assessment method which is on the right hand side which is really very simple just saying to the, the junior member of staff you know is this patient as they are usually are they usually as confused as this or has something happened more recently has there been a recent change so we ask them to fill in the questions about whether the patient has got a known dementia and whether they think they have a delirium. And as I said, this is now uh, mandatory um, for all our older patients who are admitted, and also younger patients, actually, who've got reasons to be worried about their thinking and memory. And this is just to show you the questions on the AMTS. So if any of you are older people and you come in with an unplanned admission to the JR, these are the things you will be asked. Um, now, you might look at some of those and think, well, you know, it's a bit old-fashioned. Um, and one of the issues we've had is around the dates of the war. Um, but I'm pleased to say that older people are much better that, than that than younger people. In fact, I'm horrified at the <coughs> ignorance of our medical students who don't answer that very well at all. But it still seems to work quite well for older people, um, although there are cultural issues, of course, for some of our patients it's not relevant to. 
um, and some of them, if they come from, for instance, Russia or Japan, will answer a different uh, date of start, for instance. So um, there are some issues with it, but we've validated it recently, and we think it still works pretty well, um, even though it's 30 years since it was published. And this is just what we asked our, our junior staff to do in terms of trying to decide whether the patient has a delirium or not. Now, how are we doing? So has our clerking pro forma made any difference? So one of the things we've done is a cyclical audit to look at the rates of um, assessment of older people for thinking and memory. And what we've seen is that the clerking pro, pro forma has had a major impact. So you remember my baseline data were pretty poor, so under 20% of older people had any sort of assessment. Now um, we're at about 70, over 70%, which is for the trust as a whole. So we're talking about hundreds of patients per quarter that the staff and the organisation have to screen. So I think rates of 70%, whilst we could do better, it is a huge improvement um, over a relatively short space of time. And it's all about trying to change the culture in the organisation to fit with our changing case mix. So I'm just going to um, come towards the end now. So um, how do, can we use these cognitive screening data to try and better inform what we do with patients? Um, one of the things I was interested to know was what the rates of delirium were in our patients with unplanned admission to the general hospital um, and what the rates of dementia are, because it really ought to determine what our staff training is like and how many nurses that we are required to look after patients. Um, so we did a, an audit, really, of consecutive admissions to my team, and myself and Dr Sarah Smith, over two eight-week <coughs> blocks. Um, and this might sound an easy thing to do, but in fact, under the pressures of acute medicine, this is really quite a difficult thing to do. And we tried to prospectively identify um, whether our patients had delirium and dementia and really count the numbers of cases. Um, and what we found was that for our elderly patients, over a third of them had an acute confusion or delirium, over one fifth have a known dementia, and over a half of people altogether were scoring low on the thinking and memory test, so on that AMTS 10 point score over half our older people in the general hospital score eight or less on that test. So as you can see, that the burden of cognitive um, morbidity is very, very high in this population. And this just shows you the data in another way, the rates of delirium, so acute confusion, and how it is dependent on age. So rates are 10 times higher in our oldest old patients, 75 years and above, compared to our younger people of age less than 65. And most of this occurs on admission, so people are coming into us with this acute confusional state, and it's often a precipitant for admission because the carers at home can't manage the patient because they're very confused and agitated, or they're very sleepy and they can't um, walk or mobilise. And what about the factors that are associated with um, delirium? So I've, we've talked about age, um, having a background dementia, um, having had a previous history of falls, having had a previous TIA or stroke because it's linked with dementia, coming in um, from a care home or having a care package at home because it's an ind indication of dependency, um, having the low AMTS score, being severely ill, um, being dehydrated, and being at risk of pressure ulcers. So these are all measures of, of frailty, if you like, and severity of illness. And what about during admission? So this is why it's such an issue for nursing staff in particular and for staffing the general hospital. So patients with delirium are highly dependent. So many of the patients are doubly incontinent, most of them are bed-bound, they can't mobilise independently, or if they do, they're at risk of falling. They are subject to sleep deprivation, inpatient falls, as you saw with Dr Shakespeare's father. Many of them have to be catheterised, which obviously requires more staff time. And when we look at the diagnoses that are associated with this, um, infection comes out very strongly associated. <coughs> and I'm sure so, some of you will have had relatives or been aware of people who, when they have an infection, will become acutely confused. And there's something about infection that, that seems to be a very potent cause of delirium. 
And then in terms of cost to the system, patients are more likely to stay in hospital a long time, more likely to go to an institution on discharge. Now you might think from the hospital's point of view that's not a cost to us, but it's a cost to society and the person themselves. Or they may need increased care on discharge. And again, you'll all be aware of the delayed transfers of care figures in Oxfordshire, some of the worst in the country. And this is because we have a lack of availability of care um, in the community to help these people at home. And also a much increased risk of death. And this just shows you that mortality data from our cohort. So patients with delirium, as you can see on the top there, risk of death uh, vertically. The risk of death is higher than patients without delirium, and it's very much front-loaded. So it's when the patient is at their most ill that they're most vulnerable. And that actually is significant when we control for other factors like age and illness severity. Now, I thought I'd show you um, some interesting um, data from uh, a scientific paper about what it is about infection that seems to make older people become confused. <coughs> and the theory is that when you have an infection, you'll all be aware if you've had flu, you will become hot, um, you'll develop a temperature, you may have a shivers, and you'll feel generally unwell systemically. And that is because the uh, infection will result in the release of what we call inflammatory mediators, so chemicals that get released into the blood. And the theory is that these cross over into the brain compartment and they interact with some of the cells in the brain. And this is particularly likely to happen in older people whose brains are already um, ageing and they may be less able to withstand the toxic effects of the inflammatory mediators. And it's thought that in some patients a vicious cycle is set up whereby the inflammatory mediators potentiate or may even accelerate existing pathology in the brain and result in a further cognitive decline in those patients. And I'll just show you some uh, data that seems to um, bear up, uh, um, support this theory. Um, so this is data from Sharon Inouye's group in Harvard. She's had a long-standing interest in delirium. And she has a cohort of patients um, she looks after who have Alzheimer's disease. And she's followed them up over time. And she's looked at the impact of having a delirium episode on how quickly the patient's thinking and memory declines over time. And what she seems to see in her data is that having a delirium seems to mean that you then deteriorate more quickly <coughs> after that event than if you don't have a delirium. So it looks like there's something active that the delirium is doing to the brain to make it get worse more quickly. And obviously if this is confirmed, it's very important because there may be things we can do during the delirium episode to try and protect people's brains and make it less likely for them to decline more quickly. So I'll just finish now. Um, it's one of the problems we have on the um, acute medical take or with unplanned uh, admission patients generally is trying to identify who's at highest risk of delirium. So I showed you the Clarking Pro Forma. So we want our staff to try and screen everybody for delirium and record when it happens. But it's actually quite difficult to do that in practice because you're only seeing the patient in a quick snapshot, maybe five, ten minutes when you're assessing them and then on the ward round. So it might be quite helpful to have a risk score that you could use to try and identify people at highest risk. So we've tried to develop a score for that um, using the factors that are reported in the NICE guidance. And so we basically give a patient um, one or two points according to these factors. So if they're an older person, if their AMTS score is low, <coughs> if they have infection, because as I showed you, that's very powerfully related to delirium, if they're severely ill, and if they have problems with their vision and hearing. And then we give them a score out of seven. And one of the things we were interested to see was how well that worked in our data set. So we eventually, we basically applied it to our data set of patients, our cohort of um, 500 and something patients, and we found that the score seemed to work quite well. So patients with high scores had high risks of delirium, and patients with low scores had lower risks of delirium, and this seemed to work well for both older and younger people. Um, so we were 
thinking that it might actually be something that we could introduce now to the hospital to try and help staff identify those at high risk. And I'm just going to finish now, um, <clears throat> coming on from that, so identifying patients at risk and providing better care. So one of the things we're hoping that the cognitive screening will do is allow us to personalise patient care. So we want our patients who are vulnerable to get to the right ward quickly. So we don't want confused older people being left in the emergency department where it's a very dis a distressing environment. We would like those people to be moved to a more appropriate environment quickly. Um, my nursing colleagues have developed a Knowing Me document, um, which is a bit like one of the Alzheimer's uh, documents, but can be used for any confused person or so indeed somebody with learning disability who's not able to speak for themselves and say what their likes and dislikes are. And this helps staff manage the patients in a more appropriate manner. Um, we want to reduce the risk of deterioration by making sure we hydrate our patients properly and stop them getting dehydrated, that they're offered nutrition appropriately or nutritional support. Um, with the cognitive <coughs> screen, hopefully families will be involved appropriately early on in the process. Um, when we're consenting patients for procedures, if people have got a low cognitive score, we need to make sure we're using the right process and we're not getting people to sign consent forms when they've no idea that they're even in hospital. Um, when we discharge plan for people, we want to make sure that they have a dosset box so their medications are administered in a way that's safe for them or that if they need a care package, it's appropriate. And we would like to inform the GPs that this person has got a low cognitive score or confusion and is therefore at possible risk of dementia and certainly needs to be reassessed in the community. And we have an excellent psychological medicine service now who will provide support for us with patients who have particularly difficult to manage issues around dementia and delirium. But again, if we can identify these people early on in their stay, we can get the appropriate help more quickly. And so our ongoing work, um, we have quite a lot of um, aspects to this and we've recently uh, published an OUH dementia strategy, which if you like is the national strategy but uh, worked into the local um, situation. Um, we're improving our staff training in dementia, because um, you probably won't be surprised to know that this was nationally very low until recently. In fact, Oxford Brooks didn't have a module on dementia training for their nursing staff until I think a couple of years ago, which is another example of how the system has failed to reflect the change in our case mix. We try and access carers' views about whether there's things that we could or do better in the acute hospital. And we have set up a dementia information cafe where people can come um, to the John Radcliffe site um, and ask about care um, options in the community. Um, we continue to try and drive up confusion screening across the trust. It's still quite low in some areas such as surgery, simply because the staff there have never had a lot of experience of frail older people and it's not their natural um, inclination to look for it, so we need to support them with that. Um, we're trying to review our compliments and complaints to look at things that we could do better or where we have done well, where we can take that forward across the trust. Um, our trauma group has recently been nominated for a national prize um, in dementia care at the AUH. And we're trying to, in our refurbishment of the Level 7 wards at um, the JR, to make sure that we incorporate the needs of frail older people into that design. And we're continuing our programme of audit and research with the support of the NIHR, which has been a great addition to this sort of clinical audit and research in terms of gathering data and looking at where we can do better and how we can do better to help patients. And I'd just like to finish there and I'd just like to thank, as I said, the NIHR and also our other funders um, who help with different aspects of this work, um, particularly the Stroke Association and the Wellcome Trust and of course <coughs> the patients and the colleagues in the OUH. Thank you.